the role of a philosopher. And the, a philosopher begins with the recognition that I know that I don't know. Right? I know that I don't know. That's the beginning of philosophy. It begins there. I'm not claiming to know stuff. I'm claiming to know that there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know. Right? So I do know that I don't know. Right? That's the beginning of philosophy. And since it's the case, if it's the case, that you really ascribe to that, then you have to conduct yourself. You have to live in such a manner that you try and gain as much information and transform the things you don't know into things that you do know. Right? And then my obligation now is then to share that information with you. So I go through this system ceaselessly. Right? I find areas of information that I don't know anything about. I read up on it. I research. I cross-reference. I ask experts. I gain knowledge. I come to know my, myself. I come to become an expert. An expert. I teach you, and then you teach your friends, and blah, 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 blah. Knowledge is trickled down. Knowledge is uh, disseminated. Though money might not trickle down, knowledge definitely trickles down. <laughs> You'll have to forgive me for that comment. I just have to throw that out there. Um, the interlocutor probe a person um, as archetype, typically an expert, with a specific social role and inquired into the nature of that role. Right? So the, at this point in our ethical consideration, it is impossible to separate the function that you have in society, your functional role, from this standardized normativized normativized system of virtue right the virtuous person acted in a certain way the virtuous person had a particular position a particular station in life and such okay obviously there are huge implications that follow from that but as of this point I just want to set up the conditions so that you have an understanding of just really generally this is super generalization but a really general understanding, but it's good enough to hold really intellectual conversation. This is not, a, this is not something that sort of disposable. Right? This is, it's 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 general, but it's but it's dense. We're going to need this concept and these concepts that I've just introduced in order for you to have a real understanding of the relationship between medicine and ethics, medical ethics in antiquity, right? And that becomes the question, right? And and I think this series is going to be super cool. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to do it in conjunction with my epistemology lecture series. I'll do epistemology one, one day, then the next day I'll do medical ethics, and I'll sort of like cycle through them so, so that the material doesn't become sort of boring for me. I get bored extremely easily. So it'll, it'll keep me interested in the, in the topic as well. But the idea is, wow, no, we're going to see, conceptualize what medical ethics looked like. Well, I wouldn't say at its inceptions because obviously... Um, um, Africans um, had a very, very, very old civilization, but we're doing Western philosophy, so I have to stay true to the tradition. Um, with respect to medical ethics, we're understanding the nature of ethics. What we'll need to understand is the role, right, is the role that the physician played within antiquity. Once we understand the role that the physician was said to play during that time, which, of course, will be completely outdated for our sort of medical community, but this is a broad scope understanding, then we can understand the relationship between medical and the ethics, right? How is it that within antiquity, the medical physician was expected to conduct at that time himself in order to, one, facilitate the health of the patient, and two, conform to an ethical medical standard of conduct, right? That's a very technical question, but we'll be able to understand that and, and answer it in, in a few more minutes. Okay, so lastly, 4B at the bottom of the, uh, the bottom of page one, 4B. The response from the expert shed light on how ethical actions are accomplished, right? So whatever the expert told um, Socrates for this example was the way in which you too participated, accomplished, um, acted in accordance with the, the, uh, the norm. This is based in a master or uh, apprentice master relationship, right? Which is, I think, one of the greatest relationships of all time, where the apprentice comes to know through the relationship with a master in the field, right? There are versions of this um, relationship. My, my master's thesis was um, in terms of the uh, Erastes and Romanos. It doesn't really matter the terms. In terms of the teacher and the student, 
just like I have a student-teacher relationship now, however, my student-teacher relationship now is nothing at all like my student-teacher relationship would have been in antiquity. And I'm not going to talk about the nature of that relationship because it would surprise a lot of you. But there were social norms that were accepted in that time that dictated the way in which students and teachers interacted with each other. And it's completely different than it is now. Similarly, within a medical community, there was a relationship that the physician had with his patient, which is completely different than it is now. So what we're going to do slowly, very, very slowly, and what will end up being extremely methodically, is tracking the transformation of that relationship. I'm not an MD, so I can't talk about the biology. I am a philosopher, so I can talk about transformation of social relationships. That's what I do, and that's what I do at an expert level. We're going to look at the social relationship between the physician and the, and the patient in antiquity, and then transition and track that transformation and the ethical norms that have also transferred from antiquity into, into the present. Okay, so that should be really solid, solid understanding. Right, number five. five. Thus, in terms of medicine, the question the ancients struggled with was, what is the object of medicine? What is the object of medicine? What is the purpose? What is the goal of the telos? Right? Where is medicine directed? What is, what is the point of medicine? Right? So you can imagine that you are studying to be a physician in antiquity, and of course they don't have uh, as depth, they don't have as detailed an understanding of the scientific facts of the matter. Um, so, given the information that they had, they made observations just like our scientific community makes. Their technological um, adaptability, the way in which they adapted technology for the purpose of facilitating medicine, was obviously not as advanced as our um, technological adaptability. But they did exactly what we do. There's no, there's no difference, right? They recognized in the observable external world phenomena that they perceive to create a condition of illness in their patients. And they used whatever resources and whatever technology and also ethical modes of conduct to aid in facilitating the cure. Right? In, in the Carmides, this is called a charm. And there's many things that are discussed with respect to this. I don't want to go off on a huge lecture because I'd spend too much time in antiquity but I just wanted to give you a, 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 a very solid understanding because a lot of this is going to help facilitate big time, big time, hours into, this, hours into the future of this lecture. Um, you'll be able to come back and pull these concepts out to, to have a much, much more rich understanding of all the, the significant nuances within contemporary medical ethics. So what was the, what was the object? What's the purpose? Why, why are, what's the point of ethics? Number six, in Plato's symposium, um, his name is Eryximachus, right? Eryximachus is the physician in, in the symposium. So, in Plato's symposium, Eryximachus, the physician, discusses the purpose of medicine. So, he is engaged, interlocutor approaches Eryximachus as a representative, the archetypical physician, the person who acts like a physician should act, and therefore is a representation of the standards of ethical conduct which the, um, which the physician should maintain. We don't believe this now, right? We, we, we know of many people in a contemporary setting who are really, really good at what they do, but they're not quote-unquote ethical people, whatever that means, right? Um, so in, in, in our contemporary setting, we can sort of divorce the way in which you act in your in your job function and your sort of private life, right? We sort of put ethics off to the private life for the most part, um, unless it directly interferes with your job function, and we'll talk about that later. So what does Eryximachus uh, say? What does he say is the function of um, medicine in antiquity as the archetypical representative uh, within the dialogues? So first is the nature of opposites. 